Good morning, uh, good afternoon, good evening, colleagues. My name is Serge Capto. I am policy specialist in the SDG integration team in UNDP, and I support the Integrated Policy Practitioners Network. It is my pleasure to welcome you to the 12th Knowledge Cafe of the Integrated Policy Practitioners Network and the first of first session of the year. Uh, IPPN is an initiative of uh, 10 founding UN entities to create a community space uh, where we can share lessons and experiences and strengthen our collective capacities within the UN system to apply integrated policy approaches in concrete and practical ways in support of the implementation of the 2030 Agenda. IPPN is primarily an interagency network, though it is open to colleagues in government, academia, and the broader development community. It is jointly managed by UNDP, UNFPA, UNICEF, ILO, and FAO. Uh, the IPPN holds a series of monthly knowledge cafes to showcase insightful experiences of policy integration for the SDGs. In today's session, we'll feature the Climate Risk Toolbox, which is an open access resource from the Food and Agriculture Organization, FAO, that is designed to help policymakers and development practitioners assess the risk posed by climate to agricultural policies and investment in a systemic manner. As it is situated at the nexus of the economy, food, agriculture, environment, climate change, and disaster sectors, the Climate Risk Toolbox is a good example of applied policy approaches to ensure that progress on the SDG is resilient. It is my pleasure to welcome our presenters, Lev Neritin, who is Workstream Lead for in the Environment at FAO, and Ariana Gialetti, who is a specialist on climate risk and value chains in the risk team at FAO. Before handing over to uh, Lev and Ariana, I would like to acknowledge my colleagues in the IPPN team, Joshua Gimba in FAO and Nadine Ravo in UNDP, who have worked tirelessly behind the scene to put together this session. A note on housekeeping, please make sure that your microphones are muted to allow colleagues to hear the presenters. Do use the chat function to ask questions or share your experiences and insights throughout the session. After the presenters, we'll open the floor for discussions. Uh, without further ado, uh, Lev, I will hand you the floor to start the presentation. Welcome, Lev. It's a pleasure to have you. Good morning, and uh, Serge, thank you very much. It's really a privilege uh, to be here with you today uh, to share experience on uh, climate risk management journey. At least I hope we will show you some pages from this journey today. And um, uh, really looking forward for interactive exchange. And first of all, Happy New Year to everyone, uh, to the UN family. Before I will start my presentation, I think I would appreciate if Nadine will um, start the poll, that we will have a better sense of, uh, of our audience, of your interests in applying climate risk frameworks in your uh, daily activities. So I think the poll is uh, currently on the screen. Yes, 30% participated. Wonderful. I think we're still going. Mm -hmm. Very interesting. Seventy, eighty percent, and so far a clear winner: project design. Fantastic. So I think it's it's a primary purpose of this uh, of this webinar. So it's it's really interesting that uh, the framework of climate risk management is particularly relevant for project design. I also see research, environmental, uh, and social standards, and um, UN cooperation framework. Excellent. Thank you so much. So I think I hope that uh, our presentation will be particularly uh, relevant to, to the majority of uh, participants today, especially when it comes to project design. Uh, thank you. Uh, uh, next slide, please. And next one. Thank you. 
Uh, as all of you know, uh, the relationship between climate change or in the, uh, using more scientific terms, climate variability, seasonality and extremes is very intricate for the agricultural sector or how we are recently uh, call it at the FAO agri-food systems. And the impacts uh, of, uh, of this three major manifestations of climate change are, uh, are very prominent uh, across all, all actually dimensions of uh, food security and malnutrition, which include access to food, availability of food, stability, and its utilization. Uh, climate hazards and their impacts uh, range from uh, negative effects on uh, of ocean warming, ocean acidification, for example, on the productivity of aquaculture and uh, fisheries, to increasing uh, temperatures and precipitation events, which result in uh, crop failures, uh, heat and cold stress, for example, uh, to cropping systems, but also to livestock as well as uh, very complex and uh, um, cascading effects of uh, agricultural droughts uh, and also wildfires on uh, forestry systems. As we know, the impacts are global, uh, but the, uh, the overall climate change uh, impacts are global. But obviously, some regions, particularly in the African and Asian and Central America, South America continents are uh, feeling the most uh, um, critical, um, uh, most important and, and most acute effects of climate change. And also uh, I want to mention the small island states and particularly it's important in, in our context of agri-food systems that smallholder farmers, fisheries, forest, uh, foresters and pastoralists, indigenous people are the most impacted and uh, also children and elderly people uh, which represent um, most vulnerable group when it comes to the impacts of climate change. Uh, thank you. And next one. Uh, we would like to give you a brief uh, introduction to climate risk because quite often in uh, uh, in, in the discussions of climate change policies and, uh, and various other policies, we, um, we speak about climate change in a, in a general sense. Uh, but it's very important to understand that uh, what is really uh, represent um, the, what, what is the central concept to understand impacts of climate change on various systems, including agri-food systems, is the concept of climate risk. Uh, risk refers to the potential of adverse consequences of climate-related hazard on the, on, on the identified system or the area, and it's a compounded component uh, of hazard, exposure, and vulnerability. And I think it's important to distinguish uh, between all of them and adaptive capacity, which is the ca capacity of, uh, of the system to adjust in the response to actual expected um, climatic effects. So essentially uh, a risk is the highest when all three components of climate risks, hazard, exposure, and vul vulnerability are also high and the adaptive capacity is low. And this is the definition uh, which was um, uh, adopted by the fifth assessment report of the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change. And this is definition of climate risk we are using in uh, FAO work. Uh, next one, please. Uh, obviously the ultimate goal of all our interventions is to increase overall systemic resilience, but particularly in the context of this presentation, climate resilience of um, FIU interventions. And the definition of climate resilience is, uh, again, in the, in the context of agri-food systems, the, is the ability of those systems, and again, it's important to understand that we are talking about the socio-ecological systems, uh, to anticipate and prepare, as well as adapt and absorb and recover uh, from climate, 
change, which includes longer term impacts of climate change and also um, extreme weather events. While it's the ultimate goal, the climate risk management ensures that climate risks are identified and assessed at each stage of the uh, project cycle development and also policies by identifying hotspots, identifying vulnerability and targeted communities, as well as looking at the adaptive capacity uh, present in, uh, in the areas we're working in, uh, on in our interventions. And uh, Ariana, in her part of the presentation, will go, you, uh, will take you through uh, more specific um, components of uh, climate climate risk management, particularly when it comes to uh, to the stool we want to present to you today. Uh, next one, please. Uh, as I mentioned at the beginning of my presentation, we wanted to give you a little bit of flavor of uh, our own journey of climate risk uh, mainstreaming in uh, FAO walk. And this is the walk which materialized over the course of the last uh, three years. Uh, last year, we adopted a very ambitious uh, climate change strategy, which um, I think I, I could say institutionalized the concept of climate risk management and FAO programming. And so we were very pleased that the risk language uh, has been uh, literally embraced in many pillars um, and uh, objectives of the strategy. I think what we will focus in mostly today is, as I mentioned before, the application of climate risk framework through the use of uh, climate risk toolbox in our projects. And obviously, as for many of the UN agencies, the bulk of our um, environment and climate change activities is being funded by a global environment facility and also Green Climate Fund. Um, uh, the figure on the on the right side shows um, results of screening for FAO uh, GEF portfolio. Uh, since I think the last two years, uh, we are quite proud to say that entire FAO portfolio now GEF portfolio is screened for climate risks. Also quite a recent development in the institution uh, last year, uh, we adopted the FAO new framework for environmental social management. It's basically the safeguards framework, which I think uh, one of the few, FAO became one of the few agencies which included climate change and disaster risk reduction among our nine uh, standards or safeguards, uh, which, actually will make mandatory screening for climate change risk as a part of um, environmental social risk screening procedures. And then the last one, um, I think we would really want to use this meeting as an opportunity to, to have feedback from you uh, as we are looking at ways and means how we can strengthen uh, the application of uh, particular climate risk toolbox, but also um, are the climate uh, risk screening and uh, climate uh, resilience tools we're using in the house uh, to uh, develop uh, guidance and then uh, later on apply um, these tools in the uh, common country analysis and ultimately uh, development of the UN cooperation framework. So this is the future walk. And uh, so we're really looking forward to um, to apply those tools um, in this context, uh, context. And I think this concludes uh, my part of the presentation. Uh, and uh, I'm very pleased to hand over now to Ariana. Thank you very much, uh, Lev, and thank you everyone for this opportunity to participate today. And um, I'm very honored to, to present the Climate Risk Toolbox, uh, which is the tool that was recently developed in 22 at FAO with the primary aim to mainstream climate risk management uh, with the design of agricultural investment uh, projects, uh, policy plans and decision making processes uh, worldwide, and also to, to show the key features uh, of this tool. So in the next slide, uh, please. 
um, I'm showing here um, examples of figures that can be produced uh, by the Clamaris toolbox, uh, which, as um, mentioned, it's an open access uh, resource hosted on the FAO hand in hand uh, geospatial pl platform. Uh, which allows uh, users um, from policymakers to climate funds, uh, project formulators, as well as international development uh, organizations, academia, or uh, even private users um, to perform uh, climate risk screenings uh, in a few steps and or, uh, obtain readily available information for each geographical area worldwide in a very quick, uh, transparent, and most importantly, user-friendly way. Uh, indeed, the climate risk toolbox uh, allows uh, the visualization of climate risk hotspots uh, of targeted agricultural systems and communities. So as you can see from the figures, uh, the different components of risk, as um, explained uh, by Lev, are aggregating the climate risk toolbox based on the IPCC definition of risk and adaptive capacity contributes to modulating the, the level of risk. So these maps that classi classify the level of hazard, exposure, vulnerability, and adaptive capacity, as well as overall climate risk uh, in each geographical area, from low to moderate, high, or very high risk. And uh, it is possible to do so for different scenarios. So for the baseline period uh, up to 2020, um, in process of, of being updated, as well as uh, near-term and mid-term um, future scenarios, also following two representative uh, shared socioeconomic uh, pathways, which indicate um, low emission and high emission uh, scenarios. So overall, the Climaris Toolbox was developed uh, using the most uh, up-to-date climatic, geographical, social, and economic data uh, for its risk component, which was retrieved by uh, multiple data sets uh, worldwide uh, online and available at the global level. So in this sense, in the Climaris Toolbox, um, we are processing um, original data obtained uh, into layers by applying threshold for each uh, data set which will be relevant to specific uh, agroclimatic indices and agricultural systems. But it's also important to specify that the user uh, can uh, retrieve uh, the original data and in indicators um, through the, the metadata uh, section in order to be able to assess individual layers um, to do any additional inferential analysis. So in the next slide, um, please. Um, I would like to show uh, very briefly the, um, and explain the conceptualization and databases uh, behind each climate component and their linkages uh, with the sustainable development goals in order really to um, show opportunities for synergizing uh, climate risk management and uh, the sustainable development goals and targets. So starting with uh, climate hazards, uh, this refers to, um, uh, as, ex uh, as Lev explained, to the current and future uh, climatological, meteorological, and hydrological uh, events or trends. And data from uh, for the other layers is primarily retrieved from uh, the Intergovernmental Panel of Climate Change Interactive Atlas. And uh, why this, for this information is important to integrate into the climate risk uh, management uh, framework uh, for example, uh, during the other screening, uh, the information on uh, observed and projected occurrence of extreme temperatures within the area of interest can support uh, policy or project uh, designers and developers, but up to the farm level, in planning the introduction of um, short cycle or heat tolerant crop varieties or uh, livestock breeds in order to uh, support the progress on sustainable agricultural productions, as well as farmers' uh, income, while improving uh, life on land. And the other screening can also be uh, used to recommend uh, the development of monitoring systems uh, for uh, ocean temperatures and acidification hotspots in order to manage uh, fish stocks and fish harvesting in um, fishery and aquaculture sector. So this would also contribute to preserve uh, life below water, as well as um, information on uh, projected and uh, observed extreme precipitation, uh, drought, as well as flooding events can be used as an input for designing more efficient uh, water management and irrigation systems to increase access to uh, clean water and, and sanitation, particularly in rural areas. So during the exposure um, screening, uh, instead, um, in the next uh, pop-up, uh, we are showing uh, basically our conceptualization of ex exposure, which is determined by the geographical characteristics of an area, as well as the targeted agricultural and socioeconomic activities undertaken. 
so um, the this exposure layers assess the presence of such agroecological systems and now this interact uh, with um, human uh, errors for example looking at population density and data is primarily retrieved from the copernicus dynamic land cover map uh, which is a very high uh, resolution and the, the information on the presence and exposure of different types of uh, land cover and their interaction with human areas uh, can support uh, designers with the implementation of uh, resilient agroecological systems to climate impacts, uh, such as the development of agropastoral, agroforestry, or silvopastoral systems, as well as um, the prioritization of uh, mangrove and coastal ecosystem restoration um, to reduce um, climate related impacts, uh, for example, of uh, storm surges, coastal erosion, in order to um, contribute to responsible production and consumption, as well as decent, decent work and economic growth, both in land and marine communities. Uh, vulnerability, um, the third component is determined by the social and economic conditions of the targeted population and uh, vulnerability screening assesses uh, key um, indicators that were developed by the United Nations Development Program, such as the uh, Human Development Index, the Multidimensional Poverty Index, as well as the uh, Gender Inequalities um, Index, while also looking at um, communities' dependence uh, on agriculture for employment, as well as uh, severe food insecurity conditions and the occurrence of uh, armed conflicts and epidemics uh, in the project location. Um, so these in indicators are primarily retrieved by uh, UN databases, as well as um, the European Union uh, informed database, and mainly displayed at a national level. So the detection of uh, vulnerability conditions uh, is really key to support um, income generating and value adding activities, uh, as well as disaster risk reduction measures, so from agriculture and social protection schemes to early warning systems that can uh, really enhance the resilience uh, of agri-food systems to multiple climatic and non-climatic shocks, therefore contributing to key sustainable development goals of uh, no poverty, zero hunger, or uh, good health and well-being. Uh, finally, uh, in adaptive capacity component, this consists um, in farmers and value chain actors ability to prevent or reduce climate impacts and overall uh, the effectiveness of governments the, through the presence of disaster risk reduction policies, uh, the availability of climate inf and weather information for agriculture and the socioeconomic status of targeted communities are the key indicators that are screened under adaptive capacity. Uh, also uh, through um, databases mainly retrieved by uh, the United Nations institutions. And um, the adaptive capacity screening is particularly important to recommend climate resilient policy and governance measures to promote uh, digitalization and capacity building on the use of climate information for the agriculture sector in order to reduce uh, inequalities while improving uh, industry innovation and infrastructure and well, as well as um, climate uh, sensitive um, renewable energy development throughout agri-food value chains. Uh, in the next slide, please, um, I would like to show um, the key feature, the key um, details of a practical example of the application of the Climaris Toolbox, which is, as mentioned, the Climaris screening process, uh, for which the Climaris Toolbox and its methodology uh, behind was extensively applied across the FAO and uh, Global Environmental Facility portfolio. So the climate screening uh, is the process of identifying and properly addressing climate risks at early stages of uh, projects and programs. Uh, the aim of the climate risk toolbox in this sense is really to uh, simplify and optimize the process of climate risk screening, uh, particularly by generating an automatic uh, report, which provides an early detection of hazards, exposure and vulnerability conditions, as well as uh, the indicators of adaptive capacity. And therefore, based on the identified linkages between climate risks, sustainable development goals and climate resilience opportunities, uh, the tool seeks to integrate tailored recommendations on climate resilient practices uh, based on observed and projected hazards and impacts in order to modulate the identified level of risk. And such recommendations are primarily sourced from the FAO repository on climate resilient practices that you can see on the on the slide, which was published in uh, 2021 and relevant to the key agricultural systems uh, targeted by FAO from crop to livestock, fisher and aquaculture, uh, forestry, biodiversity and value chains. Uh, next slide, please. 
So now I would like to very briefly present um, how the Cranberry toolbox, uh, toolbox works and, and what are the major steps uh, within the platform through a few screenshots. Um, so first of all, uh, the user will navigate the, the world map being a geospatial tool and determine the project uh, location, but also targeting uh, one country or every, every geospatial level using the, the drawing tool. And uh, subsequently, uh, in the next uh, pop-up, you can see how the user will select the agricultural systems of interest um, to which the screening and the recommendations will be applied. And uh, consequently, um, the user will explore and visualize the results for each uh, climate risk component and indicators. Um, and under hazard, the user will also be able to specify the um, uh, scenarios of interest as well as the shared socioeconomic pathways. And finally, after completing all the sections um, in the last uh, pop-up, the user will be able to obtain uh, the, um, the results in the form of um, a table, which can be interpreted to uh, provide uh, the classification of risk from low to uh, moderate, high and very high. And most importantly, to download the automatic uh, report which will provide the, users, the user with key results as displayed in the platform in the form of a Google document uh, modifiable by the user. And in the next slide, uh, we are going to um, show the key uh, features of the automatic report. Um, indeed, um, this is a key feature of the Climaris Toolbox because it allows users to obtain a baseline uh, evaluation and description of the climate risk in the selected area. Uh, for the specified time horizons um, and scenarios. And um, we'll primarily include for the, the maps originating from the tool, as well as the completed uh, climate risk screening checklist, which will answer each question linked to the geospatial layers as previously analyzed, as well as the recommendations on uh, climate smart, sustainable and resilient uh, measures and practices that are based on the observed and projected hazards and with, which will be tailored to the selected systems of interest in the, in the report. And finally, the user can integrate uh, project and context specific information to um, provide more in depth insights on the analysis of the climate risk component. And uh, important um, in the final uh, section of the report, the user will be able to manually complete a table on the modulation of the climate risk in order to understand uh, the extent to which uh, the project or pro uh, policy activities are uh, robust and what are the further needs to integrate climate risk management in the key planned activities. Next slide, please. So here um, we'd like to reiterate how the climate risk toolbox can be applied to every spatial level from continental to downscaled uh, at country level as well as uh, subnational level up to project levels, for instance. And here we are showing uh, approximative geolocations of an FAO project, which was financed by the Global Environmental Facility, to which uh, the climate risk screening was applied in 2022 using the, the climate risk toolbox. Uh, next slide, please. So what I would like to show here is the result uh, of the climate risk screening checklist for the project area. And in particular, uh, what can be drawn from this is uh, that climate hazards and particularly uh, rainfall uh, triggered extreme events are expected to pose a very high risk uh, to the project area, which is already highly exposed uh, to such hazards. In fact, we can see in the next uh, pop up uh, that uh, key sensitive systems are present from crop to grass cover, as well as uh, forest cover and uh, biodiversity indicators that might be particularly sensitive to such climate impacts. Uh, the level of vulnerability of the population in the area is also high, as shown by uh, high levels of um, multi poverty, indicated by the multidimensional poverty index, as well as the presence of uh, internal um, possible conflicts or, or displacement, in addition to epidemics and overall um, inequalities. At the same time, uh, the adaptive capacity is high uh, because enhanced by the presence of structured weather forecast systems and overall access to basic needs such as uh, electricity, as well as uh, a high uh, level of public support, particularly through the presence of effective infrastructure 
and uh, public measures to enhance climate adaptation in the agriculture and forestry sector. To highlight how um, socioeconomic indicators are very important in the climate risk uh, management framework and not just uh, looking at uh, the, the hazard, but how every indicator can contribute to, to the final level of risk. Finally, in the next slide, um, thank you. Um, we are showing the results of the climate risk map that uh, were retrieved from the, the climate risk toolbox at project level, which show the inter-regional inter and uh, temporal differences in the level of risk, which overall uh, resulted uh, in these cases uh, moderate risk. And on the right hand, uh, we are showing um, with the pop-up uh, the recommended uh, interventions for project design and development that were uh, provided uh, during the climate risk screening process to integrate climate risk management uh, primarily in uh, policy and planning as well as data gathering and analysis and capacity building activities. Uh, finally, in the next slide, um, I would like to reiterate how the climate risk toolbox has a potential for wide applications, um, such as, uh, first of all, um, guiding the design of resilient agricultural investment projects funded by uh, different international financial institutions. But um, a potential of the tool uh, is also to um, support users with prioritizing uh, higher risk uh, countries or areas within the country for the design of uh, policy programs such as uh, sectoral national adaptation plans for agriculture, as well as the uh, UN Common Country Analysis um, Framework. In fact, um, what I um, always like to, to suggest uh, is that based on the results of the early climate risk screening, uh, projects and programs uh, categorized at high risk uh, have the potential to seek additional support in mainstreaming climate risk management at development stages. Um, for example, through the development of more in-depth climate risk assessment that can provide a more complex analysis on past and future climate trends, as well as climate impact assessments on targeted agricultural systems, for example, using more sophisticated tools such as uh, climate models, uh, crop and hydrological models to um, strengthen the linkages between climate hazard impacts and um, recommended climate action in order to ensure that uh, climate risk management is integrated indeed in all, every stage of uh, project and policy design using the best available uh, information. So thank you very much. Uh, the next slide, we are leaving uh, our contacts and useful links. And thank you again for, for the attention and I look forward to, to your questions and, and the discussion. Thank you, Ariana. Thank you, Lev. Um, that was a very interesting uh, presentation. Um, uh, indeed, a, a very practical uh, tool. Uh, and I imagine, Ariana, that uh, the platform is available and colleagues can actually go to the platform and, uh, and, and use the tool and play with it, uh, learn the interface. The link has been posted in the chat. Um, there are already a few questions uh, are popping up in the chat. I think first one, uh, is uh, regarding the availability of uh, these resources in other languages. Um, mm. Are there any plans to uh, to have uh, these resources translated, Ariana? So that's a very good question, and indeed, uh, it should be <laughs> it feels mandatory to translate um, the the platform and use of the every feature of the platform in in the UN languages, uh, starting with that. So. It's really something that we can take into consideration and uh, possibly since it's open, uh, openly available, uh, there is the possibility to, to translate at least a uh, few sections of, of the tool. Ideally, uh, it would be great to, to confirm that. Thank you. Uh, there's also a very interesting question regarding uh, collaboration with um, other development stakeholders, um, development banks, and I think more broadly, uh, how uh, do you work with other entities, UN agencies, uh, to deploy this uh, this resource? If you can speak a little bit about uh, that engagement with other partners um, uh, to uh, support uh, agri uh, management of risk in the agri-food sector, climate risk. 
Yes, uh, definitely. Thank you very much for, for this question. Uh, indeed, the, the Climaris toolbox was uh, developed and implemented uh, um, mid-2022, uh, so very recently. And uh, since the beginning, our uh, main aim was to um, use also this platform to start and to uh, co even continue from a uh, long story of um, rounds of consultations with uh, different uh, UN focal points and institutions. So uh, to promote the use of the, the Climaris toolbox, yes, for the, um, uh, particularly for the agriculture sector, um, following FAO's mandate, but um, really to uh, highlight the possible synergies uh, with different UN institutions and, and really inspire uh, the, um, the collaboration. Uh, in order to, to share as much as possible uh, knowledge, uh, data sets, uh, information to um, improve even uh, the, the Climaris toolbox itself. And uh, so we started um, with uh, presenting the Climaris toolbox also at the WMO, so World Meteorological Organization and uh, Green Climate Fund uh, Forum on uh, Climate Science and, and Information um, in order to um, understand what would be also the, the possible opportunities for further development and uh, retrieve additional, additional uh, information uh, from different UN institutions. Um, uh, in addition, uh, as mentioned, um, we strictly collaborate with uh, the Global Environmental Facility to make sure that um, FAO, pro FAO GEF projects are screened using the, the Climaris toolbox. And we recently engaged with um, other uh, food-oriented uh, international uh, institutions, such as the, um, the International uh, Fund for Agricultural Development, in order to uh, validate uh, the, the methodology of the tool and start applying um, this methodology and the toolbox itself for uh, the portfolio of, of the institution. And uh, clearly this uh, collaboration opportunities continue. Um, it's really important to stress uh, the interlinkages also with the United Nations um, Disaster Office for Disaster Risk Reduction and um, how uh, the, the conceptualization and methodology behind uh, disaster and climate risk and resilience needs to be mainstreamed uh, across the institutions. Um, and also basically, as Lev mentioned, uh, highlighting the, the collaboration with the Global Environmental Facility and Green Climate Fund uh, in particular on the investment um, side. Thank you, Ariana. Um, uh, colleagues, please uh, keep the question coming. There are uh, a few that are posted in the chat. Um, I know, Ariana, that you wanted to uh, have a poll after your presentation. Do you want it to be launched now? Yes, yes, that would be great. Thank you. So this question um, is for, for the audience. Um, I would like to really understand, uh, since there is a lot of interest in applying uh, the climate uh, risk framework into project and policy activities, what are the key barriers, uh, particularly in access to uh, different sources of information and how to combine them uh, in order to obtain a relevant evaluation of climate risk, which uh, it, it's always very important to stress how um, this concept uh, is really interdisciplinary. Uh, and so uh, particularly how socioeconomic information contributes to exacerbate or uh, modulate the level of risk. We have 50% uh, of the audience has uh, answered the poll. Let me know when uh, you want me to end it. Okay. Yes, it's very interesting to, to see that the, the key <laughs> barriers that are lighted are also the, the same that uh, we've been facing also for for the, the development of this tool and that we would like to overcome uh, through, through our, our work. So it's very, very interesting to, to see that. So we have Mariana, 62%. Sorry, if you could 
if you could give us a little bit of flavor, uh, because climate risk toolbox is just the first step. As you understand, this is the climate risk identification and, and description in a way. But obviously, I think uh, it seems that some participants are interested in, in the issues of downscaling and the resolution of climate risk toolbox and then downscaling, particularly, uh, it's quite relevant in the context of uh, uh, green climate fund development. And also, we increasingly, as Ariana mentioned, uh, we started working with the World Bank and also with the FUD, uh, where the subnational um, data are very important. And, and then there are other tools which are complementing uh, climate risk toolbox. But I think if you can say just a few words about this, so it's yes, yes, indeed. Uh, thank you, Lev, for for mentioning that. Um, so yes, uh, as we specify, the climate risk toolbox is really relevant at the, at the design stage in order to identify the uh, overall uh, risk hotspots uh, worldwide. Um, with differences within countries or between countries uh, in order to prioritize investment needs, for example. Uh, but clearly, uh, this um, type of evaluation depends on the needs uh, of the investments. Of course, uh, it uh, progressively requires uh, much more in-depth uh, information that can be, um, of course, uh, tailored to, to the needs of the, of the project and, and the policy. And the work that we have been doing within FAO, uh, it's really uh, to, first of all, using the Camerys Toolbox as an uh, overarching tool that is relevant uh, in every context worldwide and can be applicable in order to even do comparisons. Uh, but clearly, at the further stage, um, more uh, in-depth analysis is required to really, to really, um, um, let's say, showcase the interlinkages between climate hazard, uh, climate impacts, uh, the level of vulnerability, and adaptive capacity of communities. And this clearly needs to be integrated with with more in-depth uh, tools uh, that are first of all, informed by the results of the Climate Toolbox, but then can go, can go much more in detail. So for example, um, our, our team, um, thanks to the uh, letter of agreement with the University uh, of Cantabria, uh, which is the leading institution of um, the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change Interactive Atlas, uh, we um, have the um, access to a repository uh, of um, up-to-date climate information that can be used to do a very in-depth uh, climate hazard uh, analysis. And as well as um, what is um, very frequently needed in the in agricultural investment project is uh, in-depth climate impact assessments uh, that can be performed using uh, crop models in case uh, the, the project targets uh, crop um, crops and food commodities, um, but also can be integrated with many other uh, tools uh, that can be geospatial to, to look at um, crop suitability mapping, for example, uh, as well as very important um, to integrate this information uh, with uh, stakeholder consultations at the downscale level up to up to household level uh, and farm level in order to to understand what are the the key climate resilient practices that are uh, needed and how our repository of knowledge and information on climate resilient practices can support uh, the tailored needs uh, that are really project and uh, context specific Thank you, Ariana. There's a couple of questions um, from Hema Arara um, on how the risk factors are weighted. And I think also on the technical side, availability of uh, geographical coverage, right? Availability mm -hmm. of data about all the country. And I think if you can address these very technical questions, we'll speak also a little bit about how you deal with data gaps in the platform, because we know that uh, data availability for the SDGs overall uh, remains a particular constraint. Yes, uh, indeed. Uh, so starting with the issue of um, co global coverage. Uh, so indeed, um, we rely on the repository of um, global information retrieved by different uh, UN databases, uh, as mentioned from the United Nations Development Program, uh, World, World Health Organization, uh, the European Union uh, Inform uh, database, and um, the tool um, 
um, basically shows uh, where uh, this information is available for each country or in the case of uh, exposure and hazard layers, uh, this information is transboundary. So it is independent from the, uh, the um, availability for, for each country. And when this information uh, is not available, uh, for example, one indicator uh, is not recorded for a specific country. Um, the tool um, basically um, reveals that information is not available, so it is not counted uh, in the final um, computation of the risk. And also the, the second question, um, which was related to the um, weight, weight assigned to um, layers and uh, risk components. Um, in order to be transparent and also objective as much as possible, uh, we are applying the same weight to, to every, every layer and risk component, really also to highlight how uh, climate risk is not only uh, built from a hazard, as is, it can be commonly uh, met um, trends or events and factors, but assigning the same way to every, every component, so particularly socioeconomic indicators are, are very important um, to consider at the same uh, level as um, geographical and climatic indicators. Thank you, Ariana. Um, there is another question that sounds very technical uh, okay. from Maria Lagana, um, who is asking about uh, um, how the climate risk toolbox deals with the presence of microclimates, agroclimatic zones within the same regions and project area to develop actual recommendations. Yes, uh, this is also a very good question. And um, so as mentioned, the, the climate toolbox uh, applies specific thresholds uh, that are relevant to agroclimatic um, agricultural systems uh, of interest. As, as up to date, uh, the climate toolbox does not differentiate between climates. So uh, the thresholds are applied uh, to agricultural systems uh, as, a, as a whole. So, for example, when we look at extreme uh, high temperatures, we're looking at um, the number of days in which uh, temperatures have exceed uh, the commonly defined threshold of 35 uh, degrees Celsius. Uh, but indeed, uh, further improvement of the tool that we envision uh, is, in, is to integrate uh, agroclimatic um, zones uh, within the tool and being able to um, use uh, sliding thresholds that can be more relevant to, uh, to each agroecological zone. Uh, but um, right now, um, we, uh, let's say, um, aim at overcoming this issue by using uh, objective thresholds that could be relevant to um, every context uh, in order to be as objective as possible. Thank you. And uh, also a question, I think uh, maybe a suggestions from, uh, from Jim Hancock, I think an interesting point, uh, whether the data in the, in the toolbox can be complemented with, uh, with uh, national statistical information where there are data gaps. Yes, uh, definitely the, um, the FAO hand in hand uh, just special platform in which the Clamory toolbox uh, is embedded uh, in its format, it's possible to add um, local data, so data from, from the user uh, to do uh, any type of uh, inferential analysis or do overlaying with uh, layers available in the tool while applying uh, additional uh, downscale or, for example, subnational uh, data that is available. Um, also uh, through different formats, so it's very flexible uh, on this. Um, definitely the, um, let's say, the, the structure of the tool um, does not allow the introduction of um, other layers that will be computed into the screening. Uh, so the, the process of screening depends on the layers that are in the, in the tool. But definitely, yes, it's possible to, to integrate um, other layers um, for the purpose of one specific analysis, yes. Thank you, Arena. Um, another question for me. It's, is there, um, uh, you mentioned, Lev, uh, about uh, the anticipatory aspect of, uh, of risk. Is there an element of forecasting in the, in the tool, right? Is, uh, is there a way of projecting uh, what risk would look like uh, 
over time in a certain future, near or long-term future, uh, because we know that some of the trends on climate change are quite long-term uh, right now. So, uh, and, and related to that, I think that I also heard the mention of scenarios. Uh, is it possible to actually uh, uh, use the tool to build certain scenarios of what could happen uh, in particular settings? Serge, thank you. I think Ariana would be a perfect person to answer this question. <laughs> yes, um, so I briefly mentioned during the presentation, in fact, um, the climate risk toolbox allows uh, the user to access uh, information on climate risk uh, in the baseline period. Uh, so looking uh, up to the 2020, 2022 uh, period, depending on the availability of the of the data set and um, the computation can also be performed for the future and in particular we are targeting uh, near term and mid term scenarios so um, in the near term scenario we're looking at the time frame from uh, 2021 to 2040 and uh, the mid term scenario looks as uh, 2041 2060 in the future and uh, of course, the scenarios are based on the um, um, levels of uh, greenhouse gas emissions because um, the <clears throat> component that has data for future projections is hazard. So the changes uh, in climate will be determined by the changes in greenhouse gas emissions and <clears throat> relative concentrations um, in the atmosphere. So these are the two scenarios we're looking at. Um, the um, now casting for uh, let's say early warning system for uh, very short term periods uh, is not uh, really the aim of of the tool, which looks more at um, let's say longer term sh scenarios. Um, but indeed, um, the information, particularly in the near term, can inform um, where climate risk hotspots uh, can be um, let's say um, identified. Uh, through which uh, in policy and programs um, I inform, to inform policy and programs in uh, starting developing, developing uh, targeting and tailored early warning systems, for example. And I think, Ariana, also there is uh, uh, so just some uh, part of the answer to your question. I think the user has an opportunity to select or deselect particular layers and use the tool uh, in, let's say, user-focused uh, context. So I think it's also uh, an important utility when you wanna play um, with different factors and layers um, and so on. For example, it would be quite interesting we are looking at this now, uh, as you know, the relationship between climate change, uh, food insecurity and conflict is very strong. Um, but beyond understanding the, the general trends, uh, answer to this question is very context specific. And I think that's what we are looking at the climate risk toolbox, but also other tools to basically to use this as a, if it was a research tool, uh, dissecting this uh, very complex causal relationships between food security, food insecurity, climate change and conflict. So certainly it has this utility. Thank you, Lev. Uh, uh, I see another question in the chat from uh, Erda Seller, uh, who's asking about the key difference uh, with uh, the World Bank Climate Knowledge Risk Management Tool. And I think uh, here it's uh, maybe also uh, back to that uh, point on how uh, for this for this tool, uh, the collaboration is with uh, other entities that are working in the risk space. Uh, um, I think uh, uh, a way that is also from the UN disaster uh, uh, recent network, uh, uh, there is a, a global risk assessment framework. So how are these tools complementary to each other? Yes, exactly. It's very important to stress how the, the Camerys toolbox aims at being a complementary tool uh, to, to the other uh, tools that are publicly available. Uh, for example, the World Bank um, Climate Knowledge Management Tool, uh, it's very important uh, to, for, for the climate hazard uh, component. Um, in fact, uh, it's very specific uh, to, to look at climate hazards and uh, using a different um, agroclimatic, let's say climatic, and this is not just relevant to agriculture, but 
uh, it's very broad for every climate sensitive sector, uh, whereas indeed the climate risk toolbox has the um, uh, agriculture and food security sector at the uh, sector at the center uh, of its aim. Uh, while indeed <clears throat> uh, it's always important to stress how the complementarity between the tools is very important and also how to highlight potential synergies uh, between them. So indeed in the, our process of climate screenings as well, um, it's um, it's important to use the climate to have been using the climate risk toolbox to inform uh, the overall um, detection of climate risk while complementing this information with additional tool that can provide um, any additional relevant uh, insight, uh, particularly to stress the interlinkages between different uh, factors of risk, uh, both climatic, but also socioeconomic. So even looking at uh, additional data sources um, is always important to, to really give a very in-depth um, conceptualization of risk. Thank you, Ariana. Uh, Lev, do you want to come in on that question? Thank you, Judge. Yes, uh, there was an interesting question. Uh, let me let me read it. What is the key difference between the World Bank uh, Climate Knowledge mm -hmm. Risk Management Tool, and can we upload the data to the toolbox? Uh, Ariana, please correct me on the second one. I think we uh, there is no. Uh, option to upload the data, uh, but we have another tool um, in the pipeline which actually caters exactly for this type of users. Um, but in climate risk toolbox, there is no, uh, there is no option available for that. Uh, but I will start answering the question about the World Bank because indeed this, uh, this portal has been developed uh, over the course of uh, many years. And became kind of a golden standard in climate risk identification, especially among uh, IFIs. One of the most important differences between what uh, World Bank has done and what we have done, uh, that our tool from the beginning was designed with the idea to bring together all four components of risks and automatically calculate and generate a climate risk report. So basically the hazards, the, um, the vulnerability, the exposure and adaptive capacity are all integrated and automatically calculated. So I think we, um, uh, the uh, World Bank Risk Management uh, portal uh, does not provide for this function it rather considers individual components in isolation, but at the same time, the strengths of this uh, portal also that it, unlike in our case, it, um, it multi-sector, it's not only focusing on one sector as agriculture, but it also provides quite comprehensive information about uh, uh, NDCs and different uh, national policies. I think the best way for sure moving ahead, especially in the policy contexts, using um, climate risk toolbox and the World Bank uh, portal. Again, when it comes to agricultural sector, certainly we don't cover others, unfortunately. And then I don't know if you, I, I'm looking at time, we have two minutes <laughs> left. Yes, two minutes left. Yes, no, just specifying that, um, I mean, there is the possibility to embed uh, layers uh, in the in the tool, but this cannot be used for computing the automatic climate screening process. But they can be they can be used for do overlaying exercises, for example. Thank you, Ariana. Thank you, Lev. Uh, we are almost at time, one minute left. So, uh, a last question. I think this is also an important one for both of you. For colleagues in UN country teams that would like to uh, test this tool, deploy it, uh, is there any technical support available? How do they reach you? How do they access that support? Uh, and uh, any closing remarks that you'd like to make? Thank, Thank you, you Serge. Maybe much. I can start and then okay. yes, Ariana, mm -hmm. if you can follow. Certainly we are very open. And as I mentioned, I think this is certainly a next frontier for us. 
especially when it comes to uh, to agri food systems and food security dimension, which is one of the central uh, pillars in UN cooperation frameworks, we are certainly open to dialogue with the country teams, with the uh, resident coordinators, especially when it comes to uh, common country analysis. Uh, so please reach out to us. We gave um, the contact information in our slides and also I think recording after this meeting. Uh, certainly we are looking forward um, to these exchanges uh, and uh, our team uh, is available to provide uh, at least initial support on, uh, in this area. Ariane, over to you. Thank you. Ariana. So, yes, just to finalize, uh, thank you very much again. Uh, thank you for your interest. Uh, it was amazing to participate today. And uh, just to mention that we uh, published the guiding material for climate risk screening using the climate risk toolbox, which I believe uh, will be posted uh, or is already posted on the chat. But please feel free to reach out to us, especially at this initial stage of uh, testing the tool, um, drawing uh, potential uh, analysis so uh, yes anyone who's interested it would be great to to con connect and um, discuss any potential collaboration opportunity thank you thank you ariana thank you Lev, for an excellent presentation today this was a great session and a tool that definitely uh, is very useful, would be very useful for uh, integrated policy analysis at country level in support, as you've mentioned, of uh, uh, CCAs and, and cooperation framework. I hope that colleagues can uh, try out the tools, test it, reach out uh, to FAO colleagues uh, if you need support for the tools. Uh, this is the end of our session today. Thanks a lot for joining. I invite you to join the IPPN to continue the conversations. The links on how to be part of the IPPN are posted uh, in the chat. Uh, you'll be able to access the recording of this presentation um, and the, the resources shared today. They will all be posted on the IPPN uh, webpage uh, within a few minutes, actually. Uh, so you will have access to all of that right away. Um, we look forward to seeing you again um, in our next session, which is going to be in February. Um, the session today is over. Thank you so much for joining. Have a good day, good afternoon, good evening, and a very happy uh, new year. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank, Thank you so much. Bye. Bye. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you. Goodbye.